So for the third talk on the second day of the second Qubit Summit, it's my pleasure to welcome Pooja and Ashtosh from Platform 9, which want to talk about deploying VNFs with Qubit VMs. So it's all yours. Okay, thanks, Ramon. Um, good morning or good evening uh, to everyone listening in, uh, based on where you are. Uh, so the topic for uh, today is uh, deploying virtual network functions using Qubit VMs. Uh, my, myself, Pooja Gumre, and my co-speaker, Ashutosh Tiwari, uh, we, we both work at Platform 9, and uh, we will be presenting this topic today. So let's get started. Um, let, let's get to uh, see the agenda first. Uh, so in, in short, I will cover six just to anybody who's new, what exactly is the NFE architecture, what a virtual network function means, uh, why is it being used today, what, what are the benefits of using it, and uh, how, how do you actually uh, run these VNF applications on Qubit, and what are the basic requirements in terms of application performance. Um, we'll, we'll talk about two technologies here, one being uh, SRIOV. Uh, we'll get into the details of what it actually means to use SRIOV, what are the benefits you get, how do you actually configure your cluster nodes to work with SRIOV, and uh, lastly, how do you actually deploy a VM that's uh, created using Qubit. Um, the second technology we're going to talk about is Open vSwitch DPDK. Uh, again, we'll get into the details of what exactly OVS is, what's the role of DPDK, um, the user space CNI that it utilizes. Uh, then look at the configuration steps that are required for utilizing OVS DPDK in a Kubernetes cluster. And uh, lastly, get to the VM deployment part of it using Qubit. And uh, at the end, uh, Ashutosh will, will give us a brief demo of using both kind of applications. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, when we talk about virtual network functions, you'll often hear this term first, right? Network function virtualization. Uh, so network function virtualization is basically uh, the uh, architecture uh, concept, uh, it's the name of the architecture actually, which is used by all the telco clouds today. And uh, this is the one that's uh, primarily revolutionized the telecom industry in the past few years, right? Uh, I mean, the, this has been uh, a drastic change if you compare like 3G to 4G to 5G um, infrastructures today. And uh, this is one of the core components of that evolution. Um, so with NFE, the core uh, goal there is that you don't need to have dedicated hardware for every network function in your telco cloud. Right. So, so that's the main goal, and uh, that also basically gives you the added benefits of scalability and more agility, and you know, faster turnaround time if you have to make any changes to your uh, NFV stack. Uh, so that's the overall framework, and if you look at the core components of that architecture, the the first one there would be the network function virtualization infrastructure, or NFVI in short, and, and this is primarily your um, infrastructure components, right? Like the core components like compute, storage, networking that are needed for any platform to run your software. And in this case, the software we are talking about is uh, your Qubit uh, hypervisors basically, which utilize the Kubernetes platform. So that is where you are running your network apps. Uh, second thing is the MANO uh, component, which is management, automation, and network orchestration. Uh, so this is the one uh, framework which is basically responsible for managing your NFV infrastructure, and it allows you to provision new network services. Uh, so again, the goal here is to have more uh, agile onboarding uh, so that there is no uh, you know, chaos that could be created if you have like a rapidly changing environment where you have to like deploy or uh, upgrade network services uh, from time to time. Uh, within the MANO, there are like three uh, components that I'll briefly uh, talk about. Uh, so the first one is the NFV orchestrator. Uh, this is the one that's uh, responsible for deployment of new network services, right? So any of your network applications uh, or network functions that you deploy, uh, this is the core component that's responsible for doing that. Uh, then there is the VNF manager. Uh, so we'll talk about VNFs at the end. But uh, so this is the one that oversees any 
uh, life cycle management of your um, network services. Uh, and then lastly, of course, uh, the virtualized infrastructure manager, which is responsible for managing your NFV infrastructure components like compute, storage, and network resources. Uh, so these three components together form the Mano component. And then lastly, your network services themselves that are running as software applications on this infrastructure. Uh, that is called your virtualized network functions. Right? So uh, we'll look at that in, in detail now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, so what are VNFs? As I briefly alluded to, these are uh, basically network services that are now going to um, now is in, this is this has a, been a uh, transition in the last five to ten years right and it's slowly evolved uh, but basically we initially started with proprietary hardware for running your network functions so you would have like standard app appliances that are dedicated to run like one network service and uh, virtualized network services basically replace all of that with a software component equivalent and uh, these are the applications that run that are running on top of your NFV infrastructure in, in the form of either containers or virtual machines. Um, here, obviously, we're going to talk about how do you run these VMs on the Kubeford platform and uh, how it's really being used as the foundational technology right, for, for today's 5G or edge networks. Mm, so now, some of the uh, common uh, applications of these network services are either you could have virtualized routers or firewalls, WAN optimizers, uh, network address translators, or load balancers. Like these are the typical apps that you might have uh, deployed as VNFs. Uh, now, for instance, if you take a virtual router, it's basically a software function, which is uh, replicating uh, what you would have achieved with a hardware-based uh, L3 or IP-based uh, routing and uh, replacing the dedicated hardware for it. Now you have a software function for it. Um, and as I said, most of them run inside VMs because it could be either legacy reasons or just because you're transitioning from a VNF model to a container uh, network function, like a CNF model, right? Uh, next slide, please. So let's look at the core benefits of using virtualized network functions. Uh, one of them is obviously uh, improved network scalability. Uh, this obviously gives you more agility because now it's not like if you have to add a new network service, you're purchasing uh, proprietary hardware for it, right? It, it, you already have the infrastructure in place and what you're doing is essentially deploying a new software application. So it, it makes it far more scalable and, and you can run it on like commodity hardware for different services that you want to utilize um, there. Uh, because you're also running it as a software application, you can obviously pack them more densely on, on your commodity hardware. And that gives you like the end re net result is that you have like more efficient usage of your existing uh, hardware. Again, that also means you have reduced power consumption. It gives you overall better security policies that you can configure separately for different services. Um, obviously, you also save on any physical space that you would have needed if had you like needed to store uh, that hardware in a data center, right? And because now it's not reliant on a specific hardware type for running that service, you basically get uh, hardware interoperability because you can replace the underneath underlying hardware without actually impacting your software applications there. If you also look at OPEX and CAPEX uh, expenses, like that's going to reduce because obviously you are utilizing it far more better than just having dedicated hardware. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, if you look at a virtual network function, uh, this is an app which we are basically using in a 5G environment, right? So you can imagine the amount of uh, data that's flowing through these apps and all of this needs like very low latency uh, applications basically, right? And how do you basically achieve that using your traditional uh, hardware, right? Uh, so when you have running uh, virtual machines on a cluster node, for example, in this case, uh, you want to like make the best use of your networking hardware and make sure that the packet switching uh, happens at a very fast rate as compared to your traditional apps that are not really uh, VNFs in that sense. And also when you have an NFV environment, you are typically going to not use a, a network function in isolation, right? You're going to chain together different virtual network functions because they are catering to different services. And uh, use, utilizing the service chaining, you're going to have your entire cloud set up there. Uh, 
so this obviously means that you need very efficient memory access task and resource allocations and the network IO has to be uh, very high throughput, low latency. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, the two technologies that we are going to uh, deep dive into here are SRIOV and DPDK. Uh, so, so let's start with the um, uh, next slide, please. So let's start with uh, SIOV. Uh, it stands for uh, Single Root IO Virtualization. Uh, this is a technology which basically allows you to kind of multiplex your PCI Express resources. Uh, so for example, if you have a host with two next, right? Uh, you can make it seem like you have 10 of those and create 10 virtual machines which have independent or isolated access to those 10 NIC cards. Uh, so imagine you're just multiplying your hardware at a virtual level, right? Um, so to actually run SRIOV, you're basically going to need some support at the hardware level as well as gonna, uh, you're going to need to configure certain BIOS settings and um, also make some OS configuration changes there. Uh, the two concepts that SRIOV introduces, uh, one is physical functions and one is virtual functions. Uh, now, when I say that you have two NIC cards, they're basically exposed as PCIe devices, right, over a bus. Uh, and uh, you can think of a physical function as a full-featured uh, PCIe function, which basically means that you can uh, configure the physical function independently of other physical functions. Uh, when you look at a virtual functions, uh, on the other hand, this is a more lightweight PCIe function, uh, which means that uh, you can create multiple virtual functions out of a single PF, but not really. you don't really have the same configuration resources available here. So what you, it's, it's, it's essentially the one that's allowing you to create virtual size slices, and that can be allocated to independent VMs uh, that are running your VNFs. Uh, so this also basically solves the problem with uh, if you have limited NICs, then you obviously can't have just two VMs if you have a host with two NIC cards, right? You would want to max out the CPU and memory uh, capacity on that host, which means you need more than what you physically have there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, so this is a good uh, pictorial view of what really you're trying to achieve with SRIOV. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, there is a single NIC card, uh, and that's the hardware that you have. And in this case, it's basically, uh, if on the right-hand side, you'll see that the hypervisor has an open V switch. That's just an example switch that you can have at the software layer. And what it's trying to achieve is provide direct DMA access to our VNF applications by exposing each of these virtual functions as an independent VNIC to the VM that's running your uh, application. Uh, so this is how you are basically bypassing the kernel on your hypervisor and giving the VM a direct access to these resources. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is in general what SRIV is about, right? And, and now looking at how Qvert really works with um, SRIV. Uh, there are three different plugins here uh, that have been uh, worked on by, in collaboration by Red Hat and Intel. Uh, so Intel's SRIV device plugin, uh, the SRIV CNI plugin, and then there is also a Multus Meta plugin. Uh, so first off, let's talk about uh, the SRIV device plugin. Uh, so this is the one which is actually responsible for discovering what are the available SRIV resources. On your so when you create a cluster with a certain set of nodes, it's, it's going to query each of them and see which of them are actually SRIOV capable and how many virtual functions you want to create. And uh, once it detects those, it's going to advertise them to the Kubernetes scheduler. So the resource manager will keep track of how many VFs exist on each cluster node, and it will <coughs> sorry, uh, it will accordingly allocate those to any uh, containers or VMs that you create on that cluster. Right. So this is a, you can think of this as more of a read-only plugin, which is only, uh, it's not going to modify anything on your host. It's only going to discover and allocate those resources. Uh, it achieves that by updating the capacity section. If you look at uh, each Kubernetes node definition, you would see that uh, it would show up as uh, available or allocatable resources there. Uh, the plugin, uh, so with SRIV with Qfort, uh, it relies on the VFIO PCI driver to be used with each of these virtual functions. Uh, 
next, the next thing is the SRA VCNI plugin. Uh, so this is the plugin which is basically responsible for uh, once you have allocated certain set of SRA V resources on a host, which is um, basically hosting your uh, VM. Uh, it's going to modify those host resources in a way that uh, they can be utilized by a pod or VM. And uh, you can think of it as uh, basically if you have um, different network namespaces created because you have VMs running in different namespaces, right? Uh, and it would map that to a network namespace and using netlink commands, it can basically move around a virtual function from SRAV into a different pod namespace. So, so that's the primary goal of how the SRA VCNI works. Um, now, if you were to just work with these plugins, you would also want uh, KubeWord to actually know, right, what's the PCI address of each device that you're exposing to the pod. And, and that's not something that's very user-friendly, right? That's where the Multis Meta plugin comes into play. Uh, so this is a Meta plugin in the sense that uh, it works with other CNI plugins on the Kubernetes side and allows you to attach uh, multiple secondary interfaces to your virtual machines. So that's the goal of the Meta plug Multis plugin here. And in this case, it would interact with the SRI VCNI plugin and pass over any information that you configure via a network attachment definition CRD object. And uh, using annotations on your VM pod, it would pass over that information used, uh, from QFORT. So that basically allows you to use uh, the network as a using just a resource name annotation rather than worry about individual PCI addresses there. Uh, so that's the advantage you get with that. Uh, I've just put some references to the KubeWord user guide here that goes in more detail about it. Uh, sorry, that was the, yeah, if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in terms of configuring SRAV on the host, uh, there are certain steps that you need to take. Firstly, obviously, you need to make sure that your hardware is capable of supporting SRAV, right? So, that's the first thing. Uh, then, when it comes to BIOS settings, it can differ a little bit between different hardware. So, you need to have so some hosts will have like global SRAV or per NIC SRAV flags that you need to enable. Uh, then you would also need to configure IOMMU support separately in certain cases. Um, so take it uh, based on your hardware. Uh, then you have to configure certain kernel parameters. Uh, now, depending on whether you have Intel or AMD processors, you would have the Intel IOMMU flag or AMD IOMMU flag that you need to enable. And um, specifically with QWERT, uh, I've also had to set the PCI reallocation and assign buses flags to make it work with uh, with your host. Mm, as I mentioned before, the user space driver that Qbert utilizes is uh, VFI or PCI. So you'll need to lo load that kernel module uh, in your OS. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, now, this is just briefly showing how you actually create a Qbert VM using SRIV. Uh, so if you look at the spec file of a VM or a VMI instance um, in KubeWord, uh, it will have a domain interfaces section. And uh, there you would typically have uh, at least the default pod network, right? This is the Kubernetes pod network that you can have using the default net uh, backend. Uh, it could be Flannel or Calico that gets utilized here. And um, that's the first one that you see here. Uh, and there are two types of modes that you can specify. I won't get into the details of it, but it could either be in masquerade mode or bridge mode. And the second interface here is an additional interface that you're attaching to a VM using Multis. And the type of that interface here is SRIOV. Now, under the uh, network section, you basically get to specify what each of that networks is. So for example, default here is just a pod network. And SRIOV net uh, is basically a reference to a multis network by the name SRIOV network ENO. Right? So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, so, this is how the network definition looks like, uh, or rather, the network attachment definition. Uh, the, the main thing to note here, uh, if you look at the annotations field, right? Uh, so, that is the one that's assigned by your uh, the device plugin on SRIOV that we saw, you can set 
uh, that and the config map when you configure device plugin, as we'll see in the demo, uh, you can specify a resource prefix and resource name. Uh, in this case, it's intel.com slash intel underscore SRIOB. So this is the annotation that you uh, pass to the network attachment definition. And this allows the Kubernetes scheduler to basically allocate it on, on a specific host which has that resource available when you create a new VM. If you look at the spec section, it's it's pretty straightforward. You have the type, name, and CNI version for it. Uh, VLAN ID and IPAM section is kind of optional. I've just put it here as an example uh, for reference. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into more details of SRLV as we look at the demo, but uh, let's switch to the second technology, which is OVS DPDK. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so briefly, what is OpenV switch rate? It's an open source uh, production quality uh, virtual switch, basically. And uh, uh, this this switch is basically a software switch rate. And uh, it has like two main components there. Uh, one of them is the data path or the forwarding path, which is the main forwarding module of OBS. And uh, since this uh, module is implemented in the kernel space, uh, you can obviously think of um, network interrupts, or kernel interrupts that are generated right, for any packet transfers. And uh, because of that, you could see a potential bottleneck if you are using VNF applications. And then the second component is the vSwitch, which is uh, a user space program. Uh, so if you look at the next slide, uh, it basically shows you uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, sorry, the slide before. Yeah, uh, it, it basically shows you uh, what DPD is. Uh, uh, Ashutosh, if you go to the what is DPD key slide. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, it, it basically shows you uh, an alternative to that uh, where you have DPDK, which is Data Plane Development Kit. You're doing the packet switching in user space instead of doing it in the kernel space. And for doing so, it utilizes what is called a pole mode driver. There are different types of drivers which are available uh, that can be used based on your hardware. And uh, the, the main advantage is you get here uh, combining DPDK with OVS is that you get faster packet processing because it's avoiding those kernel interrupts in this case. Um, <coughs> sorry. Now, comparing to SRAOV, uh, if you, uh, there are some like, very good uh, performance studies that have been done in this case. And if you look at uh, any east west traffic that's not uh, exiting a specific server, in that case, you'll get better performance utilizing OV and you would get SRAOV. And uh, SRAOV is basically a better fit if you want to um, run VNF applications across different hosts, you are crossing the hypervisor layer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, so this is a very good uh, diagram, which basically shows you how OVS looks without DPDK in a traditional setup versus uh, how you make it DPDK accelerated. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, uh, you'll see that the forwarding module on the left-hand side is in, implemented in the kernel space, and only the switching program is in the user space. Uh, in this case, any packets are going to cross your um, kernel space driver here. On the right-hand side, where you see the DPDK forwarding module, uh, that is the one which is implemented in user space using the pool mode drivers. And in this case, you basically get a much better performance and a higher throughput. Next slide, please. Uh, so similar to uh, SRIOV support, I uh, just want to talk about how QVert uh, exposes DPDK support. Uh, so this is still not part of uh, QVert upstream, uh, the latest version, if you look at that. Uh, but we basically were trying this out with a older uh, pull request that's that's being linked here. Uh, this work was done by Saranan from Red Hat. and. Uh, we basically just tried to uh, cherry pick those changes from that older commit onto the latest version of KubeWord, and, and we were able to make that work uh, with KubeWord VMs. Uh, 
uh, as against the SRIV device plugin, here you utilize a user space CNI. Uh, again, you do use Marta's meta plugin because you're essentially adding uh, secondary interfaces to your VMs. And uh, obviously, the OVS package that are your cluster nodes uh, that needs to be DPDK compatible. Uh, so there's different build settings or different uh, overt repo that you can utilize for downloading these packages. Uh, next slide, please. Just a short reminder, we have about five minutes left. OK. Uh, so yeah, I'll just uh, kind of skip over the user space CNI. I, I uh, like about that earlier. Ashutosh, if you can skip to the host config step. Uh, so we'll see this in the demo, but uh, basically all it's doing is it's setting up DPDK devices using FIO PCI driver. And as we'll see on the host side, it's creating um, a DPDK bridge and then adding a port to it using OBS VSCTL command line. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. And uh, lastly, the VM spec. Uh, this is similar to what we saw with SRIOV, uh, just that the type of the interface here would change to vhost user instead of uh, SRIOV. And if you look at the next slide, network attachment definition. Uh, again, you'll have uh, two sections here, the host and container that would be mandatory. Uh, and both of them specify the engine as OVS TPDK and the interface type as vhost user. And based on your OVS bridge name, you would configure that here uh, when you create a VM. Uh, so that's the spec in part. And uh, let's go to the demo part. Uh, Ashutosh, if you can just uh, share your terminal and uh, show the VM YAML and a running VM. Uh, hey, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay, so uh, so to start with, uh, we have a single load cluster. So we have uh, already kind of uh, configured it with Qbert. So we use this Qbert CR and Qbert operator to uh, configure Qbert on this cluster. So we have used some uh, feature gates like Numa and CPU manager. So this was required uh, for PMD uh, CPU pinning. So which is kind of, uh, so uh, DPDK uses this PMD driver and uh, allocate some CPUs to it for core mode driver. So, so it can just, uh, it's isolated for PMD and it gives a better performance. Uh, also we have to change some, uh, what we call grub config, like huge pages support. And this uh, IOMU for BFI or PCI. The huge bit is required for the vhost user, which is the underlying mechanism used by user space. So vhost user socket is, okay, maybe we can uh, talk about that when we come in there. So uh, yeah, yeah. Ashutosh, maybe you can just share the VM YAML since we are short on time, the network attachment definition and the VM YAML that you have. Okay, maybe let's create, uh, So we already have a OBS DPDK bridge configured. So this uh, network attachment definition, right? So it uses this. So we are, we have a one bridge configured, uh, we are DPDK zero. So we have used ENO two and four as a NIC for 
using this bridge uh, dptk0 and yeah so if we with the configs for this bridge we have dptk init through socket memory configure and cpu mask which kind of gives the what codes to use so basically we have taken care of numa awareness when using this course uh, so now this NAT or network attachment mission, this uses this bridge. So we already saw this NAT, right? So this is just what Pooja shown uh, before. There's the host part and the container part. This container part goes in the virtual launcher pod and this remains on the host. So we have this VMI, sample VMI spec. So we are using this, what we call, uh, we host user net one, what we created in this network attachment definition. Okay, so this net one is the what we created and we just gave it a logical name and using that in the vhost user uh, interface plugin. So this spec uh, is basically the same, just the uh, huge page is mandatory here because vhost user relies on this. So yeah, we can see this uh, as dptk vm running. If we look at the obvious vs cutter, so it creates this vhost socket, uh, which is used by the vmi and uh, this obvious bridge to communicate over. This is basically coming from the uh, pod identifier. Okay, uh, so yeah, we can look into the vmi. Sorry for interrupting, but we're running out of time. Um, sure. I guess yeah, do, you, can just... do you want us to go to the questions which we still have? Or... Sure, yeah, I guess that's, um, yeah, sure. Maybe let's move to the Q&A. Okay, thank you. So let me just, so if you wanna show- I'll stop sharing, right? Okay. okay great. If you wanna enable your camera, that's also great for the Q&A session. <laughs> So the first question is from David. Is there a reason that network functions need to be virtualized or will we start to see a transition to containerized network functions moving forward? Uh, yes, that, that's a good question. And, uh, and like I briefly alluded to CNFs, uh, so we do have uh, customers basically who are running telco clouds and they have a certain set of legacy network functions that are still running inside VMs for for whatever reasons, right? And it could be because uh, they were never uh, slated for my containers or because they are going to uh, eventually move to containers because as you can imagine, it's it's a huge network uh, service chain, right? And to move is gonna take maybe more than a year, definitely for companies to kind of start transitioning to it. Uh, so that's the core use case that we are looking at here, utilizing Qcode because that way you can run CNFs and VNFs on the same platform using Kubernetes. And that's the beauty of Qcode here. Thank you for the answer. And the next question was from Andre. SRV device plugin partnership with Intel. Can you point to the Intel device tested? Is there any other collaboration, perhaps Xilinx, now part of AMD? Uh, sorry, I didn't see the question on chat. Uh, yeah, so the device plugin partnership. Uh, sure, I can. This is something maybe I can share more info on this. Or, uh, for QWOT or, or maybe put here in the chat. Uh, so this is a plugin that's developed by Intel and uh, Red Hat has also been uh, collaborating with that. Okay, great. So I wanna give Marcelo for his talk some time too. So uh, sorry if we didn't go through all questions, just feel free to write emails or to keep your dev to ask questions. Thank yeah. you, Pooja yeah. and Dashut, for yeah. a great talk.
yeah. and let's hand let's directly go 